Steel Curtain Network. Don't take any <laughs> I knew you were going to do something like that, Dave. I was listening. I was like, yeah, he's going to do something. But this is Steelers Preview Podcast. Welcome back, Steeler fans. Triumphant Trio returns. I'm Jeff Hartman, joined by Dave Schofield and Brian Davis. Dave, what's up? Uh, not too much, Jeff. Um, coming in a little bit happy because in the 4 o'clock-ish window of March Madness, I didn't do a bracket. I haven't done one for a couple of years. Used to do it all the time. Uh, I did do a, a, a four-team parlay bet, and it looked like I was going to get three out of four until Dayton went on a crazy run and then won that game. So I'm doing pretty well there. Listen to Pez. Put my put my boost on, the, on Oregon. Won that one. Bet on the Duquesne Dukes to win against the money line. Got that one. And got the correct over-under for last week's show, despite someone bragging how they were in the driver's seat when they had a show earlier this week. <laughs> Who are you talking about bragging? <laughs> you talking about me or Brian? Oh no! I mean, if you listen to the "Here We Go" the Steelers show, Brian had that locked in. Oh, the that's Steelers right. were going to do that. That's right. That was Monday. That's a long time ago. Brian, welcome to the show. How's it going? I don't even know what Dave's talking about. What I've locked in? <laughs> it's my show, and I have no clue what I said. I was. Go- I don't even know where we're at. What are you talking about? We did an over under of how many moves the Steelers would make by our next show. Oh yeah, and, and you're bro- oh they've done two. I took the over of three and a half. I They're going to have tons of moves this week. And then nothing. <laughs> yep. Nothing. Yep. Except for a coach, yeah. and that doesn't count. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Anthony mentioned. Welcome to the, the yep. club. So good to see you guys i i'm glad to be here my bracket is actually perfect right now thanks to the duquesne dukes and i haven't done the bracket for the last couple years because for the first time in my life i cannot name a single person in the player in the tournament i uh i i might be able to name a coach but that might take me 10 minutes just for Uh, one coach you know calipari yeah yeah, uh, calipari's team make it in i don't think they made it in Kentucky. Nah, St. John's didn't make it in. He, he he's not Kentucky. He's St. John's, isn't he? Yeah. John no, Calipari. no, that's Patino. That's Patino St. John. John, yeah, yeah, Kentucky is in it. They play Oakland at seven twenty. Oh, really? Okay. I, I might be thinking of the wrong coach. I can't even remember anymore. I I can't <laughs> either. But you know what? I'm still glad we're talking football. I he's still a big think... Steeler fan too. Yeah. John Calipari. He's the one that talked about being a yeah. Gizzer. I was thinking of Patino. That's what I was thinking of. I, you know, I think there's still more moves to be made. So don't you fret. It's happening. Okay. I haven't done a bracket in forever. I do the pool where I get numbers. And if your numbers hit throughout any time of the tournament, you win money. So it's actually a lot of fun. I enjoy it a lot more than the bracket. So, all right, let's talk some Steelers here. Uh, The Steelers did not make a lot of moves, actually no moves outside of, is it Anthony Midget? Is that the assistant secondary coach's name? Dave, you wrote yes. the article. Okay. Uh, so Unless hey, it's mid-J. I mean. Could be. It could be. He's an assistant. Anthony secretary. Mid-J. That's right. Um, maybe that's just what we'll call him on the show. <laughs> if we ever, hopefully we don't ever have to talk about him. To be honest, he's an assistant secondary coach. Like, what, Why yeah. would we ever talk about Mr. Mid-J? Nonetheless, uh, Coach Mid-J has been hired. The Steelers continue to add to their staff, which I think is a good thing. Um other than that, the news has been about players either that aren't on the team anymore or are now leaving the team. So James Pierre, he was an unrestricted free agent, reportedly signing with the Washington Commanders, and a former Steeler, Cam Sutton, is being hunted down by the law in the state of Florida. Uh, oh hey, this it's, is insane. Yes. It's, it's a, is it assault? Is that the, the charges against Cam Sutton? He's got, he's got several. Yeah, and so this, he's... Uh, He's out there. This is not good. (laughs) It's not good at all. I I think allegedly he's being sought for throwing a woman out a third story window. Is that? I don't know if that's, that could be true. That's what I heard, but I have not confirmed that that's actually what happened, but I have heard that that's, yeah, I don't, I don't, we should be stating that because that's what happened, but yeah, that's the, that's, I did hear that. Yeah. Yeah, I thought wow. I got that off of our Slack channel, and I I haven't. But I this this is this is horrifying to me. It, 
it really is. And I am thankful that uh, he's not on the team. And we're not talking about a Pittsburgh Steeler doing it, but I am still horrified that an NFL player, a human being, actually did that. Yeah. If or whatever it is, whatever any kind of domestic violence. And yes, the Detroit Lions did release him. Uh, he was due like ten million dollars, but that was voided, probably based on his arrest. And I'm sure there's some language and verbiage in the uh, contract, but uh, you don't you don't want to hear that ever uh, about anyone, like you said, Brian. And Let's let's focus on football. I don't want to go down that road. It feels like I'm talking about Richard Gummies again back in that <laughs> era. But uh Gummies. <laughs> I don't know if Dave was a part of this. <laughs> was were you a part of this, Dave? Of oh, the, yeah. the whole po- the podcast. Yeah, Dave group? was around okay. for I Richard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for those that for those that know, you know. Uh, but no, seriously. <laughs> Let's talk about uh, Jimmy Pierre for a second. Uh, Sweet Jimmy P. Jimmy Pierre saying. is is going to be. We, we, we reached the point of the show where Brian is snorting. So uh... <laughs> we're only six. We're only six minutes in too. <laughs> Welcome we to the preview. Welcome, um, yes. <laughs> Dave, or let's get answer, Dave. What, what are yeah. your thoughts on um, on James Pierre not coming back to Pittsburgh like he did last year on a one year deal? What are your thoughts? Um, I did not want to bring James Pierre back because I feel cornerback is a is a position where you get uh, special teams play from guys at the bottom of the uh, of the depth chart, regardless, because it lines up well with with what you're asked to do during that that position and being able to to do something like that. So it's not crazy to say, oh, you only want him just for special teams. His play at cornerback was not good enough. I mean, Joey Porter Jr. is trying to run back onto the field against Seattle because he didn't want to have Pierre out there, and Pierre gives up a touchdown. Um, so he, he didn't play a lot of snaps on defense. My thing is, if you're going to get get better, you have to improve the bottom, you know, or have the guys that were at the top and middle of your of your depth chart then be the guys at the bottom. You know, I, as I said before, I don't think the Steelers are bringing back Levi Wallace. But if they did, it would, be, to me, it would be in James Pierre's role, not in not as high as he was last year. You want that level player in that role. So, so you're just vastly improving. And with the and with the young guys, you know, three young guys that the Steelers have that they shouldn't be banking on. But man, if one of those guys really show out, if or even two, then you don't even have any anywhere close to room for a James Pierre. So it's not really a big loss for the Steelers. I didn't think he was going to come back just because I wanted to have that room for these other guys that people were really excited about seeing what they can do next year. Just so you know, I'm talking about Corey Trice, um, Darius, Rush. Darius Rush, and Luke Barku. Oh, Barku. That's it. That was the third. I couldn't yeah. think of the third. Okay. He might end up being the best of the three. I don't know, Ooh. but I mean, he could be. He, he has yeah. that potential, too. Brian, any thoughts on Jimmy P? You know what? I, I kind of think that uh, I thank him for his service. I think he did a great job here. Uh, he played above what uh, what a lot of his potential was, and he was valuable in special teams. I think special teams players are manufactured a whole lot easier. When you have one of the best special teamers in the league in Miles Killebrew, who came back, you know for a fact that you have that guy as kind of the anchor of your special teams, and you have other hungry players. And Dave talks about this all the time when you're talking about, especially when we're talking about who's on the bubble, who you're bringing in. It's that special teams experience, whether it's running back, wherever it is, it's the guys that have special teams experience that make the team and they make a name for themselves. Now you have a guy in hall of fame consideration who has, uh, who is now in the conversation the who, who came in after being cut by the Steelers and the Ravens a couple times in James Harrison that made his bones on special teams. Next thing you know, he's going a hundred yards in the Super Bowl. I mean, it's just special teams. You Every once in a while, you get that special player out of special teams. But if you lose one, you're not, it's not killing you as much. 
you can you can get those extra guys. So I, I think he did well here. I think he had a good career. He's probably going to get an NFL pension based on just being in Pittsburgh alone. Okay. Uh, let, let's, since we're talking about cornerbacks, I just have a quick question for both of you. Dave, we'll start with you. What would need to happen for you to entertain, uh, entertain bringing back Patrick Peterson? Yeah, it's so interesting. Cause as soon as I finished the show Tuesday night with my brother, when we were talking about safety, I'm like, you know, we didn't even mention bringing back Patrick Peterson. But to me, Patrick Peterson, he, I mean, he could be a guy that you would, you could do that with, but he's also then not going to be your special teams guy. You would need it from other places. But if you do, I think he gives you reserve play across the entire secondary, both cornerback and safety, and would probably be better off in safety. And you don't have to worry about him not, you know, having an issue with communication or not knowing exactly where to go for everything. It would be that you wouldn't have a fall off in that regard. But to me, a Patrick Peterson reunion would be something that would probably be more likely definitely after the draft, but possibly even into the summer if there's still no takers and he wants to play. Brian, agree or disagree? I'm bringing him back. I I really would, but exactly with what Dave said, I'm waiting a while to see, um, take his temperature to see, you know, how his off season has been. When I say off season, have you uh, have you embraced the retirement lifestyle, even though he hasn't retired? But are you still um, up to playing shape? But basically, in the Dwayne the Rock Johnson role, know your role. If you know exactly who you are and why you're there and you're there to be a coach in the locker room that happens to put on shoulder pads and eye black and goes out there and uh, participates in a pinch, but with no expectations of starting role and want to be a part of something and want to help mentor Joey Porter Jr., Corey Trice, Luke Barku, anybody else that comes around young, even in uh, even in the draft, you know, yeah. I it doesn't hurt to have a guy at the veteran minimum though coming back to me. Yeah, no, to me, I wouldn't even consider it unless it was an injury. So when you think about like Corey Trice in training camp, Patrick Peterson doesn't need mini camp OTAs, even most of training camp, probably. But if there's an injury or you have a couple injuries at the position, you need some proven veteran depth. Depth is the key word, not a veteran starter. That's the only way I'm I'm considering Patrick Peterson. I just feel like even there's there's still quality options out there on the free agent market now. Are they going to cost more money? Absolutely. But you're also going to get better play from those players as well. So just something I want to throw in there as we touch on the news and all that fun stuff. Um, I'll tell you what. We're going to take an early break because we're just going to get it out of the way. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about glaring needs going into the NFL draft. Is it that big of a deal? For those listening on the audio side, we'll be right back after this break. All right, Steeler fans, we are back. And for those watching on YouTube, Twitter, or Facebook, we didn't go anywhere. And we are talking about the NFL draft. And everyone seems to freak out whenever you say, well, the Steelers don't like to go into an NFL draft with a glaring need. And that's true. I don't think any team, though, that's not unique to the Pittsburgh Steelers. And when you look at the Steelers and their roster right now, there are holes in the roster. And we know center might be the most glaring. Some would say offensive tackle is an issue with Chooks of core for being released and them not being having much depth there proven depth. Let me put it that way. Some might say inside linebacker with Cole Holcomb's health could still be considered on that issue as well. Um, corner safety, possibly defensive tackle. There's a lot of them, a glaring need though. How do you define it, Dave? A glaring need is when you really don't have someone that on your roster that you've deemed as starter capable when you go to the draft. So out of the positions I named, which ones would be a glaring need? Glaring need? Honestly, right now, I would say definitely center. Wide receiver is more depth than glaring need because you could technically say George Pickens, Van Jefferson, Calvin Austin, the third. The thing is, are you really comfortable with that being your top three? 
that makes it a little bit different. So I think it's a need. It's just not to the same level as you are with center. I know, I know everyone's going to, everyone will say, oh, well, James Daniels has played center. Oh, Isaac Elton Sam always played center. Oh, Nate Herbig's played center. Okay. None of these things are things that the Steelers have, have really addressed that they would, that they would ultimately like to do. It might be their plan, but they haven't, haven't showed it to, to us there. So to me, I, I feel that the Steelers, when they went into the 2022 draft, or 2022, which one? No, 2021 draft. Sorry, wrong one, wrong okay. one. Um, that they had a glaring need at center. Yeah. Um, I don't, I wouldn't like them to do the same thing again because then you're relying on a guy to have to win the job, or they should have picked somebody higher when they had the opportunity. So to me, center's the one that stands out more than anything. And the other ones are needs. They just aren't as glaring as what yeah. I would as what I would classify something like All right. center. Brian, you wanted to uh touch on that. I look like you wanted to say something as Dave was talking. Yeah, I, I started doing the Macho Man Randy Savage thing here because I was getting all yeah. uh, I was gonna go all antsy Ooh, with my yeah. fingers. <laughs> uh <laughs> so here's the thing. Center, absolutely correct. I think I still think there's a Brian Allen possibility at center yeah. uh as mm -hmm. we get later in this whole deal. Wide receiver is less of a glaring need for me now. And like everybody's gonna go crazy, and like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't forget about Denzel Mims, 6'3", mm -hmm. and Marquez Calloway, late of the New Orleans Saints, 6'2". And when I had Roy Countryman on the show the other <laughs> day, <laughs> you knew I was going there? I knew you got this from Roy. I, I listened to your show. I like, brought, no, 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 no. I brought it up to Roy. I brought <laughs> Calloway up to Roy. Oh, okay. All yes, right, cool. I did. I did. I was proud of this. Well, why why was... would you even say that when you have Des Fitzpatrick, who actually was on the Steelers 53 or pulled up from the practice squad at least once last year? He's 6'2". He's another one. Yeah, but so there are guys there. And I yeah. forgot about Des. I did. I mean, from the University of Cincinnati. You know, I mean, he's a good player, but and he's your a special teams guy. He's quick. Marquez Callaway, I think he did he had six touchdowns, I think, two years ago for the New Orleans Saints. Uh Denzel Mims is a good player. You know, they are craving large guys, especially in the Arthur Smith offense. So I you know I could see them. You know, relying on one of those guys, it's, it's better than my Hakeem Butler crush of last yeah, year. It, it really mm -hmm. is. You know, I, I think mm -hmm. that the these guys have uh, have had a decent run. They have not been bust, but a decent run. Callaway's one that Roy was more excited about than Denzel Mims, and he is less of a name. But if you look at him, and I'd love to talk to our buddy down with the Dome Patrol, Wesley Coleman, about a guy like Callaway because he spent uh, all of his career there and they picked him up in January, a move that kind of went under the radar for me. So yeah, I, I know. Do you, are you comfortable with Calvin Austin as your third? No, probably not. Or as your second, probably not. But are you comfortable with, uh, uh, of course, Van Jefferson? No, probably not. So they're going to make a move here. It's probably going to be before the draft. Uh, so I would not completely get all bent out of shape about that. Yeah, Des did go to Louisville, excuse me. But with all of that, I don't think wide receivers as big of a deal. You know they're probably going to get back to taking a wide receiver. But if you think, if you're reading the Justin Jefferson stuff, no, stop. It's, yeah, that's uh, That's probably not going to be the direction that they go. But now that we have anything that can happen, Omar, you know, there's, <laughs> you can hold on to hope if you want. So for me, I, I always think of it and I feel like glaring is a, is a term that has multiple facets to it. So right now, if the draft were tomorrow, I would say that <laughs> the glaring need at center would mean, cause anyone remember the old school setup where, the draft would be at Radio City Music Hall and all the tables would be set up and they'd all have like a little helmet phone. <laughs> Every yes! team had their own helmet phone and stuff and they'd pick up the phone. Steelers were on the clock. I feel like the Steelers people that would be at that table would just be walking up and down the aisles holding a picket sign that says, 
we need a center. Like everyone's going to know it. Yeah. We need a center. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And then you have like offensive tackle. So you let Chukes walk. Uh, they do have some players that tackle, but I don't think anything that people are confident and comfortable, especially the fact that no one's confident or comfortable with Dan Moore Jr. already at left tackle. So you have that need as well. Now the Steelers mm-hmm. love Dan Moore. They love them way more than the, the, the fan base does. But I, I think about all this and I think, okay, this is the question that I posed with the topic for today's podcast. Is it that big of a deal? Dave, you brought up something I was going to bring up anyways, 2021. They yeah. entered the draft. Everyone knew they needed a center. What are they going to do? Kendrick Green was drafted, but when? He was drafted third in the round. third round. So I look at this draft class and this glaring needed center. Let's just talk about that position first. And I say, okay, is this really that bad? Let's say they don't get a free agent center. Let's say they get some schmuck, not Brian Allen, who has starter experience. Let's say, let's say they roll the dice with, was it Steven Anderson? Wasn't that the seventh round pick from Maryland last year? Spencer Anderson. Spencer, thank you. So let's say they, hey, Spencer is going to be our backup in case all hell breaks loose. But we're going to draft a guy who's going to be ready day one. This class has several players who could probably fit that mold. Whether it's Jackson Powers Johnson from Oregon in round one, whether it's Zach Frazier from West Virginia, or whether it's uh, Van Pran from, uh, and I think he threw another name on there, Granger. From Georgia. Um, Granger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so from, wait, from Georgia. There's so, more. Oh, wait. There's more. There's, there's that Duke mm-hmm. guy who's yeah. a guard who could flex uh, the center. Graham as well. Barton. Yeah. Is that his name? I'm pretty sure. I think you're right. I think that's correct. So I look at this and say, mm-hmm. okay, so what if they do go in with a glaring need? I think they could still address that on day one or day two early. And they have some draft capital to move around. Mm-hmm. Omar Khan's willing to do that. I just don't think that when you have a glaring need, you can sit on your hands until round three and then think that some guy who played the majority of his career at guard is going to somehow magically turn into a center Mm -hmm. and, oh, he's going to be the center for your Hall of Fame quarterbacks last year. (laughs) Dave, what do you want to say? Yeah. To me, I don't think you can go into the draft with multiple glaring needs. I think that's that's the bigger issue. And now some people were saying that offensive tackle is a glaring need. I don't agree. I think offensive tackle is an obvious upgrade. That's how I would classify it. You have both guys that were starters last year returning. The person who played the most at offensive tackle last year is returning. But you should, but you want to upgrade it. That's the difference there. But you're like, oh, well, what about the depth? You don't have chooks anymore. They really like Dylan Cook. They had him on the 53 all season. Spencer Anderson, you mentioned him. He's a guy that can play five positions. Yeah. So who knows where they where they want to go with him? They need another tackle. It's not a glaring need. And what I and to me, could they could they draft a tackle um, in the in the fourth round and say, okay, now we got another person in there to to, to be that depth swing tackle like Chuksakora for? They could. That's not what I want them to do. I want them to go big. I wanted to go big at tackle and really get a an upgrade so you can have your, you know, I'm sorry. I, I even went around one. I do. And unless you're going center, if it's not center or tackle in round one, it better be uh, a, a, a corner that you didn't think was there or something like that. Yeah. So to me with tackle, if you're going to do it, you've got to go big. Or it's not even going to be worth it because then you're like, oh, you're just messing around with Dan Moore again. And it would be better. I mean, I know the Steelers like Dan Moore, but everybody should be upgradable. Yeah. Well, I, I want to bring up a couple of comments here that I see that I just think have value. First and foremost, Brian Mizwa from Facebook. I've never heard this nickname before. Saloon Door Moore. I love that. That's hysterical. <laughs> That's a great nickname, Saloon Door Moore. Let's hope that doesn't happen. But then, you know, you have... He's not as bad as what fans that don't understand offensive line make him out to be. And and something that Mark Tobin says, and I put There you go. We can live with Dan Moore one more season, to be honest. And then that gets followed up by uh, Jarrell Williams, who says, I can live with Dan Moore with Darnell Washington attached to his hip in Arthur Smith's offense. That's a good point, too. Yeah. When I hear this type of stuff, this is what I love about our live chat. For those Mm -hmm. that watch live on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or whatever, the comments, like they they do make you think a little bit outside the box. So if the Steelers said in round one, we're going to go, I don't know, uh, let's say Jackson Powers Johnson is their guy. They want the best center in the class, and they deem that he is the best center. So they go JPJ, the new JPJ 2.0. He's their center, 
And then in round two, they go wide receiver. And then round three, they go defensive line. And then round three, because they have two third round picks, they decide to go with a Corner. inside linebacker, you just know, out of yeah, curiosity. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, everyone's like, what about tackle? Oh my gosh, what about tackle? What are they going to do with tackle? Maybe their plan is that, you know, we're fine with Dan Moore this year. And maybe they like Dylan Cook enough to be that swing tackle as a backup. Or maybe they just address it in a veteran that hasn't been signed after the draft. It's not what people want to hear, but they only have seven draft picks. <laughs> yeah. You have all these team needs, and you only have seven picks, none in the fifth round and none in the seventh round. So, Brian, what's your take on this in terms of glaring that term and what you would label as a team need that would fall into one of those categories? I've never seen a Pittsburgh Steelers mock draft since I've been following mock drafts follow the progression of what everybody thinks they're going to do. Not a lot of people put defensive linemen in their mock drafts, usually. And all of a sudden, they're picking one. You, it, it happens more often than not because their list is different than our list. And it's always going to be because they're looking at it by being in the same room in the same facility with these players and talking about this every single second of their existence. I'm sure that the coaches' wives and the scouting department's wives are tired about hearing about the pro day of uh, Georgia and how Cedric Van Fran Granger ran. You know, I'm sure they're here because I know, my gosh, my wife's tired of hearing about fans first sports network and steel curtain network stuff all the time. She's not tired of it, but she's, uh, and she listens. It's really cool about it, but I'm telling her all this stuff of, of, uh, what we're planning on doing, what's going on with numbers. And she's like, Oh, that's great. And I know that man, I'm boring the hell out of her. I, you know, gosh, it's a good thing. I look this good or she's going elsewhere. Um, but <laughs> that's when you guys laugh thank you uh I so, did. <laughs> right on cue we were there <laughs> you can't make uh, it you can't you can't be too quick to the laughter there because then you're gonna think that i'm i think you're ugly or something <laughs> anyways so <laughs> here you go i'll let you laugh at this with that being said there um, it is there <laughs> it is <laughs> there we go. so we're back <laughs> you, you know i i'm looking at this whole thing as there this is a puzzle. I would love, seriously, I would, pay, if I had so much money and, you know, some people would say, man, if I had millions of dollars, I'd find my way on a uh, space expedition and go to Mars, you know, or something like that, man, if I had buku dollars and I could go somewhere, just like put me in, not just the draft room for that night, but for the whole week before and that night and let me just keep my mouth shut. In fact, put duct tape on my face, you know, tie me to the chair like a hostage in a, uh, a 1970s uh, prison movie um, or whatever. But anyways, what I'm saying, or, I would or, love or Saturday night at the beehive. <laughs> Saturday night at the beehive. Yeah. I mean, that's a, my gosh, that's, that's going to the ATM <laughs> for <laughs> emergency <laughs> trip to the ATM. Uh, so, I would love to see this process because where we have plan A, B, C, and D, and we know exactly where they are, they've got, they've got F, S, seven, you know, they, they know exactly everything that they want to go, every direction they want to do. It, it's, it's kind of like, uh, all right, they go here. So we have to swerve here. So, it, you know, it's like, if they do this, we do this, if they do this and, the biggest lie that the Pittsburgh Steelers tell you is, well, we don't let other teams dictate the draft for us. Now, that is a lie. It's I, I see where it's true. I see where they're like, okay, we know where we want to go. But no, the draft is dictated for them because when Bill Belichick decided to screw the New York Jets, they were glad to help Bill do the screwing. You know, so they had no problem to move up to help him in that plan and get Broderick Jones. So, you know, there are all these swerves on draft day. You, you could never, you could figure out, you could be in contest for draft day contest to see how many of the correct picks you're going to get. You might get the first three or four, and then somebody pulls a trade out of nowhere where somebody pulls a pick that you're like, whoa, that remember the old days when Crip, 
Chris Berman would go, whoa, and he'd, he'd lose his mind. Yeah, that's going to happen. So they, there's so many things. So we could tell them where they want to go. They're going in different directions. It's going to be interesting. I, I just wanted to shine a light on the fact that I don't think going into a draft with a glaring need is as damning as people think. But Dave, I agree with what you said, and I like what you said, how you can't go into a draft with multiple glaring needs. If you have one, you just need to address it early and find someone that can fill that need and that you think is a, a bona fide day one or at least early in the season starter. So Joey Porter Jr. wasn't a day one starter, but they eased him into it and you knew that it was just a matter of time. So I think that's important to note. All right. Any other final thoughts on that before we move on, Dave, Brian? One more. Yeah. Most likely your week one starter is Dan Moore Jr. With uh, even Probably, if they yeah. draft some, even if they, they draft a Marius Mims. You know, unless oh, don't 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 get my hopes up there, bad. You, you know, unless I like that unless, one. Yeah, uh, but you know, well, if they draft Mims, he's probably your right tackle, and BJ is is your left tackle. But you you never know how they're going to do this. You you might have to. They, they kind of like they kind of like that little bit of an apprenticeship. Remember the big one of the biggest apprentices of all time and if you're a fan of the Steelers in the early 2000 the late 90s early 2000s and you love their defense you knew that Dick LeBeau was going to sit you no matter how high profile of a defender you were Troy Palomalu is one of your biggest apprentices and where people were going my oh, this guy's a bust yeah all right the next question that I want to ask you guys is about some of these rumors I, I asked Jeremy Betts on my Let's Ride podcast for Friday about this and just want to get his take. So all these rumors flying around that the, the Steelers are looking to upgrade the wide receiver position, but doing it via trade. I have heard rumors about, obviously, Brandon Ayuk of the 49ers. It's the most talked about and discussed trade rumor, and that's all they are. We have no intel on these whatsoever. Uh, I've also heard Debo Samuel's name. The one that intrigued me maybe the most was actually Terry McLaurin from Washington. Uh, mm. I think that that's an interesting one. And I think there was another one. That, oh, of course, Jeremy brought this up on the on the podcast that runs tomorrow morning on our audio feed is if Stefan Diggs were even a possibility. Now, I just want to ask you all what you think about the potential of having to trade for these players. You know what it's going to take. It's going to take a, a good a good bit of draft um, stock. We'll put it that way. And it's also going to take a lot of money because most of these players are going to be paid handsomely. Dave, what's your take on any of those rumors? Uh, giving up high draft picks and money is hard. And yeah. I don't like it. If it's one or the other, it's a whole different story. For example, mm -hmm. Minka Fitzpatrick gave up high draft stock. Wasn't much money because he was on his rookie deal. If, but if you could go out and sign, sign a player that you don't have to give up any capital for because they're a free agent, that's a different story because you're not, because you're giving up the money, but not the draft capital. Both is a double whammy. And as I've been saying to uh, some on the website uh, recently, both free agency and the draft, it's a wild card. There is no guarantee that any player you ever pick up in free agency or you draft is ever going to work out. That's why the safer you can make it, the better off. It is. That's why so many people are like, oh, why are Steelers fans excited about Russell Wilson? Who cares that he only costs that much? Because it's so low risk. So when you're low risk, that's when you're just looking for that high reward. It's it, same with Justin Fields when the, when the draft capital ended up being so low and not even this year. So you're looking to, when you're looking at one of these things that, yeah, they might be a proven NFL player, are they going to work in Pittsburgh? Therefore, the having to give up so much for them is extremely difficult, especially when you know you just shipped out Deontay Johnson and didn't really get, you know, maybe I'm Dante Jackson's we'll get to see what he does in, in Pittsburgh, but it didn't seem like the Steelers got a lot in return for, for Deontay Johnson. So it'd be really tough to be giving up high draft picks and money in order to bring in one of these wide receivers. Not if they do it, I'm going to feel like, hey, they believe in it. I'm going to get behind it. But I, right now, before it's done, I don't really like the idea 
of what it could potentially cost. Brian, what's your take on the potential trade stuff? You know what? I, if you're all in, yeah. If you really think that you're going to get there, you kind of, if you go into that mode of mortgaging futures and looking at that, yeah. The McLaurin one was interesting, and I was trying to find it on, uh, I'm not sure who put it out on Twitter. I think it was somebody from the fan. And it would be, it was something, you were basically losing a number two pick, but you were gaining back, you were, actually, you were trading your number one pick, but you were getting like number three, 31 back or something in i think the uh what they in the chase young deal or no not chase young but what they got another pick i think the commanders had another pick or something there's all this moving around where it was kind of an attractive deal and people on twitter was like yeah we would actually go for that instead of like poo-pooing something like it i can't remember exactly what it was but you know i would i would entertain if that player is young enough if you could come in and it's something that could probably put you in that upper echelon and that conversation where it's not this team is competing for a wild card, but this team is not only competing for the division title, but there's somebody you're penciling in the Vegas odds books are penciling them in as uh, one of the participants of the AFC championship game. You might want to really look at. Yeah. You, yeah, McLaurin. Uh, you bring McLaurin. in McLaurin for eighteen point five million salary that he would command this year. If you're how many just years, inheriting his contract, how many years got, does he have left? He's got two left. Uh, well, technically, it's three. He's got a void year, but that that wouldn't transfer. That that's not. Yeah. Well, how that doesn't affect the Steelers. So, um, the same thing happened with um, with Dante Jackson. He he had void years, but they redid stuff. He's got. I mean, you look at his cap hit for this year and next year, it's 24.1 and 25 million, but only 5.6 of that is from his signing bonus. Everything else is cash paid that they have roster bonus, per game bonus, workout bonus. All of that adds up to where you're talking. It's like it's like 18, 5 and 8, and let's see the other one. Uh, and 19.4 would be his two base salaries for the last two years of his contract. It's like I say, sometimes you got to pay to play, you know? Yeah. I mean, if, if it's a, if it's a guy that's valuable enough, they don't have those big, ba those big contract players on the offensive side of the ball. They all reside on the defensive side. If you think that it's a difference maker, you find a way. Like, like Brian always says, couch cushion con. He's a guy that can find the money. They restructure Cam Hayward's deal. They re they maybe uh, Alex Highsmith is the next one up probably to get a, a, a deal adjusted for his contract. I, I think that if, if it's valuable, I just, the draft stock is what gets me. Like I would not want to give up a first yeah. round draft pick. If the commander said, we'll take, we'll take a second or something like that. Maybe, I don't know, but just wanted to get Charles take on that. Brian, anything else? Those thirds are uh, pretty nice. I, I think that third round pick is uh, for posturing in some way. I, I think that third round pick, just like, and by the way, Jeff said this last week and on the preview, something that Jeff said, he's like, man, I'd love to see them trade over way one of those back-to-back -back picks in the fourth so we don't have to write and talk about it on draft day and i was thinking about that when they did i'm like jeff was like the soothsayer he here he <laughs> no, but now we, now you're gonna stay up late until one of the last picks of the night oh, on friday night that sucks <laughs> that sucks you can barely Wait, stay awake yeah, well that's next year though right that's this year no because they got that they got they the traded, comp pick the comp they pick got the, the eagles round. comp pick at the end of oh, the oh, on Friday night, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I, but it's Friday night. It's yeah. that's a that's a different it, animal. It, it's a night that ends in Y for Jeff. He, he yes. can't stay up late any night. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is, I think that third round pick was acquired to give away, to posture Maybe. and and whether it was before the Brandon, I mean, excuse me, before the whole Justin Fields thing happened, and in that tight, I mean, that was a tight window between the the picket trade and and the uh fields trade but in there was possibility that they were going to try to pull a minnesota vikings and start making moves and posturing to maybe are they going to move up 
for a top quarterback yeah. in this draft. Now that talk is has subsided, but I still think that third round pick is there to dangle. We'll see. We shall see. All right. I, I wanted to get through a show because we've had a lot of talk about quarterbacks and stuff this week on our evening shows and, and talking about the just feels of we did that. So I, I wanted to get through a show without it. And we did that. So let's, let's move on to some trivia, Brian, uh, you have trivia. Yes. Yeah. I have an interesting one. And this is about a, you know, we've heard about free agents coming into the building and you think they've signed them. And that actually happened to the Pittsburgh Steelers. It happened in 2003. In the 2003 offseason, they signed, They it was reported that the Steelers are signing this player, this defensive player that made a splash in the previous, uh, the previous postseason. And they were going to sign this player to a five-year deal. They... This player ducked into the Steelers elevator and took a call from the Arizona Cardinals who offered him more money and he backed out of the deal with the Steelers. Who is that? And who is the player that they ended up with? It could have been a draft pick. It could have been another player as a plan B. You're saying 2003. I actually yeah, knew defense. this because this was in yeah. this was in the the book by uh, Jim Wexel and oh, great. I'm not I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, well, no, but because wasn't it? I can't remember the name, but I know it was that. Oh, well, then instead the Steelers drafted Palomalu, right? Yes, mm-hmm. because it yeah. was in that because it was in the book for, of Jim Wexel. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Okay, I now know it because I, I didn't even want to look at the live chat, but there it is. I, Mike I Tomlin coached there, him in the Super Bowl, but he didn't. Yeah. Uh, but Bill Cower was the Steelers' coach at the time. It was Dexter yeah. Jackson. It was yes. Dexter yeah. Jackson. Yeah, so and, I'm like, I couldn't think of the name, but as soon as I looked, oh yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, two. So. Uh, when you get when that guy has that great Super Bowl where he gets two interceptions, like Larry Brown against the Steelers, don't sign him to a big deal. It was sometimes that's mm-hmm. just an aberration if he's not if he's not a uh, a great corner or a great safety uh, a great interceptor and that's kind of what happened with with the Arizona Cardinals regretted that deal. Yeah, no, it was a great story, and I, I would definitely recommend anyone that likes that type of talk to check out two books by Jim Wexel uh, on the clock. By Jim Wexel is a great read about Steelers yeah. draft stories. The stories about the '70s groups are just awesome. Uh, and then also check out the Palomalu book, which starts out with a lot of that stock that Brian just had. So that was good stuff. Um, is that it, Brian? Yeah, that's my trivia question. Okay, good, Dave, you're up. All right, I am the king of wishful thinking because tonight we're going to go west. It's very simple. And then this will lead to a couple other questions. Who was the last player the Steelers drafted who attended a college that was in the mountain or Pacific time zone? That was in that part of the country. Who's the last player they drafted? Whose Hmm. college was David DeCastro was Stanford. Uh, I, you know, and I'm just going to go with a quickie here because I would think Juju Smith Schuster, cause I, I know he was in 2017 and I know he's USC. So Jeff kind of sparked me with the caster. Then I'm trying to think of, uh, PAC 12. Yeah. PAC 12. Mm-hmm. So uh, should I keep on thinking, Dave? Well, is that, is that the answer you're going with? Well, right now I'm going to go with, yeah, because I, I, I just decided not to uh, overthink it. So I'll go with Juju. You'll go with Juju. Jeff, do you have a, do you have a, there's a guy that played for Washington who is a pass rusher. And I just can't remember what year. I think he was before 2017. Yes. Travis Feeney was 2016. Yes. Okay. But Brian, yeah. you were extremely close because on a technicality, in the same 2017 draft, drafted after Juju Smith-Schuster, so it's more written, more closer to this time, was Brian Allen out of Utah. 
Ah, yeah. yeah. But the yeah, same the, draft. You were right. It was the 2017 draft. draft. Okay. 2017 was the last time the Steelers drafted a player. Now, Jeff then also answered my other question. When's the last time they drafted a player in the Mountain or or Pacific time zone in the first round? And Jeff, that was David DeCastro. David DeCastro, yeah. Okay. And actually, since Mike Tomlin took over as the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers, he is the only one in the first round that they have drafted um, out there. And they didn't attend his pro day. So when people want to talk about, oh, do they attend the pro days and stuff like that? They also don't attend the pro days of players that far west. So it doesn't rule them out. If it's someone who's closer and they don't go to their pro day for the first round, that's a whole different story. But at the same time, they also don't draft players from out west very often. In fact, the Steelers have drafted 136 players since Mike Tomlin has come on board as the Steelers head coach. Out of those 136, how many of them do you think came from colleges in the in the Mountain or Pacific time zone? 25. I'm going to go 14. Well, it's in the middle. I guess technically Brian didn't go over. The answer is 17. So Brian was closer to it as well. 17 out of 136. That's only 12.5%. So they really do focus on this part of the country when it comes to their to their draft picks. Um, there Now, there, when you look at the schools, which college – do you think they drafted the most players from under Tomlin that fits that category? There's one school that they drafted three players and several other where they drafted two. Hmm. So this is 20 or 2007 and closer. Is, is Oregon up there? Shockingly, it is Oregon with three. Uh, I know Dennis Dixon. Oregon. Dennis Dixon. Dennis Dixon. Sonny uh, Rashawn Sonny Harris. Uh, let's see, where was it? Uh, the, 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 yeah, Rashawn Harris. You know the other one? Can't think of the third. Give me, uh, I'll give, I'll give you a year. Dallas, not Dallas Baker, he was Florida. Um, give me the year 2012. Yeah, round. um, seventh round, he was, uh, he was, uh, a receiver out of Colorado. Oh, oh no, Oregon. Oregon. We're talking Oregon. Oregon. Um, <laughs> there was a receiver out of Colorado that was drafted in the seventh round um, in 2012. That was Tony Clements, but there was more Tony than one seventh round pick. It was they had four seventh round picks. Yes. Because Beecham was there. And mm -hmm. I know it's not Beecham because he's SMU. Yep. I can't remember his name. It was David Paulson. Never would have gotten that. The tight end. Yeah, yeah, I knew yeah, that. Out of, Never out would have Oregon. That. Yeah, and what's crazy when you look at these picks, the uh, DeCastro was round one, um, and there's only there was only one who was in round two. Who you was your guess, which was Juju. Okay, after that, there was two players. I'm sorry, three players in round three from from out west that were drafted under Mike Tomlin. And they were Marcus Wheaton from Oregon State. Yeah. Keenan Lewis from Oregon State. And the first pick from, from, the, from the Mountain or Pacific time zone of Mike Tomlin, Bruce Davis from UCLA. Hmm. That was it. So they, they don't draft them very often. And when they do, they don't draft them very high. So that's another one of those key things to look at. Is it possible for them? Yeah. I mean, David DeCastro was one of those they're too just too good to pass up. Are the Steelers going to have a situation where they have someone from out west that's just too good to pass up? Um, I, I can think of a tackle uh, that would fit that category, a couple of them maybe, um, if you're thinking first round. But uh, other than that, it's just really interesting to see how the Steelers really do stick to mainly the East Coast. They, they do. It's not even very much where they even go west of the Mississippi River. I mean, they'll dip into Texas and technically Louisiana. Um, but even then, you're talking Wisconsin, Ohio State, a lot of the other places, uh, obviously Georgia. 
uh, of where the Steelers are going. But I just yeah. found that interesting that it's been since 2017 that they've drafted a player that went to college in, in the mountain or Pacific time zone. That, well, you know that who, just seems crazy. Do you know who the Northwest uh, recruiter or not, of our scout is for the Steelers? Is that? Yeah. The, uh, the 1995 Bruner? first round Bruner? Pick. Yes. Mark yeah. Bruner. And wasn't Shidi Awuma, who's from the University of California, Cal Berkeley, wasn't he a, a recruiter too? Like a, a scout? He was a scout. I don't know if he's still with the team, but he was at one point, yeah. But yeah, Mark Bruner's still like the Northwest main scout for the Steelers, and he that's what his job is. Yeah. Interesting that you say Bruner real quick because mm-hmm. i was going to mention the 1990s where from if you know me i talk about the colorado connection all the time for the 90s it seemed like they had scouts hanging out like uh, scouts had mistresses in colorado or something or uh, yeah because they were getting guys from the boulder all the time but from 93 94 and 95 it was uh it was university of colorado university of colorado and washington yeah first round yeah all right, good stuff. Let's do some uh, do some final thoughts. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, we haven't talked about. Uh, I'm ruining it because Jeff said, "Hey, we didn't really uh, overstep on quarterbacks and talking about quarterbacks." I, I just wanted to mention something real quick. There's we've had so much talk about. Oh wow, you have uh, you have two playmakers at quarterback. You have Russell Wilson. Now you have Justin Fields as Pittsburgh Steelers. Are they going to are they going to his option? Are they going to bring him out? Is he a long-term stealer? Are they thinking about that? I was kind of thinking that if you will t- know right away what they think about when they dole out the uniform number to Justin Fields. If they give him number 11, then you know they're gonna wait and see. But if they go ahead and go against the grain and for the first time in 30 years, 1994 was the last time it wasn't given out. It was the last time number one was given out was 1982 for Gary Anderson. But the last time a Steeler wore number one was 1994 being Gary Anderson. If they give him number one, then he's a lot higher on their list if they go ahead and change change things around yes they gave patrick queen number six something they don't like to do either and we saw that just you know last year they didn't give joey porter jr a uh a number in the single digits which uh it sounded like he was looking for one they didn't give agent zero darnell washington number zero they didn't do that but i could see if they're really committed to justin fields I have a feeling they're going to have no problem giving them number one. So it will be interesting to see what they do with that number. And, and you can see what their possible commitment could be when that happens. It's a good point. Good point. Dave, final thoughts. Yeah, that is a good point there, Brian. Um, and I, I find it interesting because it seems like guys they draft that have no choice but to side with the Steelers. They're not going to try to appease, but free agents that are coming in might be a whole different story. Um, so who knows what it is with Justin Fields because it was a trade. Ooh. What's our over-under for next week, Jeff? 1.5? Um, what did you say, 1.5? 1.5? That's what I was thinking. So Brian's, well, Brian's going the over. Brian's going I, to going over. over. Coach Maje does not count, by the way. <laughs> is, is that really his? Is that really the pr- pronounce, pronunciation know. of his name? <laughs> I don't know. No clue. That's what we're going. That's what we're, we're going. One and a half. Brian's taking the over. Dave. Um. If it's any old signings, I'm going to say over because I wouldn't be shocked if we find out. You know, somebody's back with the Steelers. Um, like in a like an Elijah Riley or some or you know one of those kind of signings. okay. So last week, last week we specified outside. Oh, outside. outside. Mm-hmm. Then I'm, I think I might go under. I, I think though, I think there that's could fine. be one, but I don't. It's going to slow down. I, that's crazy. I'm going under. I think they might sign one player, yeah. but I don't think it's going to be a huge yeah. number. So, yeah, and right. I, I'm. Just part of my final thoughts, I would say for those of you that are like, oh, well, whatever happened to Tyler Boyd and everything going there? 
you know what? Maybe this is a situation with the Steelers where people that were interested in Boyd, they're now maybe Boyd's trying to get more money, and now other places that would possibly sign him are finding other people like the Jets. Then they signed Mike Williams, like Kansas City. Who did they sign? Who? Marquise Brown, Hollywood Brown. Yes, Hollywood, Hollywood Brown. That's what it was. Um, and things of that nature. So maybe, maybe the Steelers are being patient uh, because they can't. Uh, until a player signs somewhere else, there you can you can show some patience. So maybe there could be a signing like that. All I know is that we are about a month away from the draft, just over a month. That's going to be a whole lot of fun because we know we're going to be getting new members of the Pittsburgh Steelers when that rolls around. Right, right now we're just kind of you know twiddling our thumbs, waiting to see if there's any more happening. But you've got to. You've got to be excited about this year. I mean, you don't have to be, but a lot of people are. I'm, some people just want to be down. They just think that, oh, no, that's not a good sign. Oh, that's not going to work out. What are they going to do? I'm excited, but I, I said this before. It almost feels like a video game because it, it's – I can't – I'm struggling vision, you know, envisioning that number three and that number one or five or whatever it ends up being, you know, running out onto the field for a preseason game and watching them in the huddle and everything. It, it's hard because it's so far removed. But they're really doing a good job shaping this roster. I hope it plays out for real on the field as much as it does in our mind. But until it, until we get there, the, the best thing we can do is keep coming back here every Thursday night and talking to you all and having a good time to get one week closer to next season. Absolutely. And hey, if you're watching live on YouTube, don't forget to give us a like, uh, subscribe to the channel. We do appreciate it. And if you're listening on Apple podcast or Spotify, give us a five star rating. Leave us a good comment on Apple. It does help with the algorithm algorithms and we do appreciate it. All right. That does it for another Steelers preview. Dave, why don't you send us out like you always do? Hey, see you next week. Take it easy, folks. Everybody else gets a little tight.